So I'm still reading Understanding Power by Noam Chomsky. And he's, um, he's just talking about the dissident movement in America and how that there are still folks from the 1960s who are embedded in the system, in the media, and uh, in the universities, and in the publishing firms, and the political system. So you do have some activists from the flower power 1960s who can help us, uh, who can help the Occupy movement. So, let's see, carrying on, and I will get to Occupy, but I, these things are important to kind of set the groundwork, I think. So, take something like the human rights policies of the Carter administration. Now, they weren't from the Carter administration, really. They were from Congress. They were congressional human rights programs, which the Carter administration was forced to adapt to, to a limited extent. Now, they've been maintained throughout the 1980s as well. The Reagan administration had to adapt to them somewhat, too. And they've had an effect. Uh, they're used very critically and hip... Uh, hypocritically and we know all that stuff but nevertheless there are plenty of people whose lives have been saved by them well where did those programs come from where they came from if you trace it back as kids from the 1960s who became congressional assistants and pressed for drafting of legislation using popular pressures from here there and the other place to help them through the proposals worked their way through a couple of congressional offices and finally found their way into congressional legislation New human rights organizations developed at the time, like Human Rights Watch, Watch, and out of that all came at least a rhetorical, uh, a rhetorical commitment to putting human rights issues at, in the forefront of foreign policy concerns. And that's not without an effect. It's cynical, doubtless, you can show it, but it still had an effect. The U.S. Network of Terrorist Mercenary States. Question. It's curious that you're saying that because I certainly didn't have that impression. The only human rights issues the Reagan administration seemed to be concerned with was that of the Soviet Jews. I mean, they resumed funding the terror in Guatemala. But note how they did it. They had to sneak it around the back. In fact, there was more funding of Guatemala, Guatemala under Carter than there was under Reagan, and that's not very well known. See, the Carter administration was compelled to stop sending military aid to Guatemala by con congressional legislation in 1970, and officially they did. But if you look at the Pentagon records, funding continued until around 1980 or 81 at just about the normal level by various forms of trickery. You know, things were in the pipeline, that kind of business. There's, this was never talked about in the press, but if you look at the records, you'll see the funding was still going through until that time. The Reagan administration had to stop sending it all together. And in fact, what they did was turn to mercenary states. See, one of the interesting features of the 1980s is that, to a large extent, the United States had to carry out its foreign interventions through the medium of mercenary states. There's a whole network of U.S. mercenary states. Israel is the major mercenary state of the United States, but it also includes Taiwan, South Africa, South Korea, the states that are involved in the World Anti-Communist League, and the various military groups that unite the Western Hemisphere. Saudi Arabia to fund it, Panama, and Noriega was right in the center of the thing. We get a glimpse of it in things like the Oliver North trial and the Iran-Contra hearings. Oliver North was tried in 1989 for his role in Iran-Contra, the U.S. government's illegal scheme to fund the Nicaraguan Contra mil militias in their war against the Nicaragua's left-wing government by covertly selling weapons to Iran. There are international terrorist networks of mercenary states. It's a phenomenon in world history way beyond what anybody has ever dreamt of. Other countries hire terrorists. We hire terrorist states. We're a big, powerful country. Actually, one significant thing came up in the North trial, uh, Oliver North trial, to my surprise. I didn't think anything was going to come up. One interesting thing was put on record, this famous 42-page document that they referred to. I don't know if any of you saw that. See, the government would not allow secret documents to appear, but they did permit a summary to appear which the judge presented to the jury saying, you can take this to be a fact. We don't question it anymore because it's authorized by the government. That doesn't mean it's not disinformation, incidentally. It just means that this is what the government was willing to say is the truth. Whether it's true or not is another question, but this 42-page document was kind of interesting. It outlines a massive international terrorist network run by the United States. It lists the countries that were involved, the ways we got them involved. All 
of it is focused on one thing in this case, the war in Nicaragua. But there were plenty of other operations going on. If you expand it to look at, say, Angola and Afghanistan and others, you'd bring it in more pieces. One of the main players is Israel. They've helped the United States penetrate black Africa. They've helped support the genocide in Guatemala. When the United States couldn't directly involve itself with the military dictatorships of the Southern Cone in South America, Israel did it for us. It's very valuable to have a mercenary state like that around with it, which is militarily advanced and technologically competent. But the point is, what was the need to develop this huge international terrorist network involving mercenary states? It's that the U.S. government couldn't intervene directly whenever it wanted to anymore. So it had to do in it in what amounts to quite inefficient ways. It's a lot more efficient to do what Kennedy did, to do what LBJ did, just send in the Marines. That's efficient. It's an efficient killing machine. It's not going to be exposed and put a crimp in the works. You don't have to do it around the corner. So you're right. The Reagan administration did support Guatemala, but indirectly. They had to get Israeli advisors in there and Taiwanese counterinsurgency agents and so on. Just to take one example of this, the chief intelligence for the FDN, the main contra force in Nicaragua, FDN, defected about six months ago and named a man, a guy named Horatio Arce, A-R-C-E. He's the most important defector yet. This was, of course, never reported in the United States, but he was very widely in, interviewed in Mexico. He had a lot of things to say, including details of his own training. He had been brought illegally to Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, and he described in detail what the training was like there, and then in San Salvador, where he was sent for paratroop practice. The trainers from all over the place, they had Spanish trainers, plenty of Israeli trainers, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, Ta Taiwanese, Dominicans, separate Japanese trainers for the Mosquito Indian recruits. They've got a huge operation running. And it's all clandestine, and it's all obviously illegal. And it's lethal, all right. I mean, in Guatemala alone, maybe 100,000 people were killed during the 1980s, and the popular movements were decimated. But lethal as it was, it would have been a lot worse without the restrictions that would have been imposed by U.S. domestic dissidents in the last 25 years. I think that's an important point. If you want to measure the achievement of the popular movements here, you have to ask what would things have been like if they hadn't been around. And things would have been like South Vietnam in the 60s when the country was wiped out and may never recover. And remember, Central America is a much more significant concern for the United States than Vietnam. There's a historical commitment to controlling it. It's our own backyard. And American business wants it as the equivalent of what East Asia is to Japan, a cheap labor area for exploitation. Yet the Reagan administration was unable to intervene there at the level that Kennedy did in an area of marginal American concern, Vietnam. That's a big change, and I think it's primarily attributable, attributable to the domestic dissidents. After all, what are the Iran-Contra hearings about? What they're about is the fact that the uh, government was driven underground. Well, why was the government driven underground? Why didn't they just come out and uh, do everything up front? They couldn't. They couldn't because they were afraid of their own population, and that's significant. You know, it's very rare that a government has had to go this deep underground in order to carry out its terrorist activities. It's an unusual situation. I don't think there's even a historical precedent. So he don't think there's a historical precedent, uh, precedent that the government had to go underground in order to carry out its uh, terrorist activities, the Reagan administration. So the Reagan administration did get nervous for uh, a while, uh, for, for a minute there. Operation Mongoose, right, uh, right after the Bay of Pigs invasion attempt failed, Kennedy launched a major terrorist operation against Cuba beginning November 30th, 1961. It was huge. I think it had a $50 million a year budget that's known. It had about 2,500 employees, about 500 of them American, about 2,000 what they call assets, you know, Cuban exiles or one thing or another. It was launched from Florida. It was totally illegal. I mean, international law we can't even talk about, but even by domestic law, domestic law, it was illegal because it was a CIA operation taking place on American territory, which is illegal. The CIA is not allowed to have any operations on American territory. The NSA is allowed to tap our phones. The NSA, if they suspect us being a terrorist, can tap our emails. So they probably have everybody's emails in the whole country. 
and it was serious. Uh, it, it, Operation Mongoose involved blowing up hotels, sinking fishing boats, blowing up industrial installations, bombing airplanes, and this was a very serious terrorist operation. The part of it that became well known was the assassination attempts. There were eight known assassination attempts on Castro. Eight known assassination. This is 1989. A lot of this stuff came out in the Senate Church Committee hearings in 1975 and other parts were uncovered through some good investigative reporting. It may still be going on today. We usually find out about these things a few years later, but it certainly went on in the 1970s. Actually, let me just tell you one piece of it that was revealed about a year ago. It turns out that Operation Mongoose practically blew up the world. I don't know how many of you have been following the new material that's been released on the Cuban Missile Crisis. The 1962 U.S. Soviet showdown over Soviet missiles in Cuba, but it's very interesting. There have been meetings with the Russians. Now there are some with the Cubans, and a lot of material had come out under the Freedom of Information Act here. The Freedom of Information Act was brought forth by Ralph Nader. And there's a very different picture of the Cuban Missile Crisis emerging. One thing that's been discovered is that the Russians and the Cubans had separate agendas during the course of the crisis. See, the standard view is that the Cubans were just Russian puppets. Well, that's not true. Nothing like that was ever true. It may be convenient to believe, but it's never true. In fact, the Cubans had their own concerns. They were worried about an American invasion. Now, it turns out that those concerns were valid. The United States had invasion plans for October 1962. The missile crisis was in October 1962. In fact, American naval and military units were already being deployed for an invasion before the beginning of the missile crisis. That's just been revealed in the Freedom of Information Act materials. Of course, it's always been denied here. Like if you read McGeorge Bundy's book on the military system, he denies it, but it's true, and now the documents are around to prove it, and the, Cuban Dallas, the Cubans Dallas knew it. So that was probably what was motivating them. The Russians, on the other hand, were worried about the enormous missile gap, which was in fact in the U.S.'s favor, not in their favor as Kennedy claimed. So what happened is there was the, that famous interchange between Kennedy and Khrushchev in which an agreement to end the crisis was reached. Then shortly after that, the Russians tried to take control of their missiles in Yuba in order to carry through the deal they had made with the United States. See, at that point, the Russians didn't actually control the missiles. The missiles were in the hands of the Cubans, and the Cubans didn't want to give them up because they were still worried, plausibly, that there would be an American invasion. So there was a standoff between them early in November, which even included an actual confrontation between Russian and Cuban forces about who was going to have physical control of the missiles. It was a very tense moment. You don't. You didn't know what was going to happen. Then right in the middle of it, one of Operation Mongoose activities took place. Right at one of the tensest moments of the cru uh, missile crisis, the CIA blew up a factory in Cuba with about 400 people killed, according to the Cubans. So the CIA killed 400 Cubans during the missile crisis. Well, fortunately, the Cubans didn't react, but if something like that happened to us at the time, Kennedy certainly would have reacted, and we would have had a nuclear war that came very close. Although there was a terrorist operation which might have set off a nuclear war. That wasn't even reported in the United States when the information was released about a year ago. It was considered so insignificant. The only two places where you can find it reported are in a footnote on another topic, actually, in one of these national security journals, International Security, and also in a pretty interesting book by one of the top State Department intelligence specialists, Raymond Garthoff who's a sensible guy. He has a book called Reflections on the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis, and he brings in some of this material. So that's some of the past uh, stuff that's happened. Here's some, um, something about the Rosenberg trial in the 1950s. Uh, they sold, I guess, the Russian nuclear, nuclear secrets. They were executed for treason by the U.S. government in 1953. The Rosenberg execution had nothing to do with national security. It was part of trying to destroy the political movements of the 1930s. If you want to traumatize the people, treason trials are an extreme way. If there are spies running around in our midst, then we're really in trouble. We better just listen to the government and stop thinking. Look, every, every government has a need to frighten its population. One way of doing that is to shroud its workings in mystery. The idea that a government has to be shrouded in mystery is something that goes back to Herodontus, ancient Greek historian. You read Herodontus, and he describes how the Medes and others won their freedom by struggle. And then they lost their freedom when the institution of royalty was invented to create a cloak of mystery around power. See, the idea behind royalty, royalty is that there's this other species of individuals who are beyond the norm and who the people are not supposed to understand. That's the standard way you cloak and protect power. You make it look mysterious and secret above the ordinary person. Otherwise, why should anybody accept it? Which is a good question.
Uh, Chomsky, Understanding Power. More to come.